Good morning. Good to see you all again. I wasn't here last week. I played hooky. Church hooky is bad for the pastor, you know. That's just something about that. It's a crime. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Canada to bear hunt this last week. Now, you may not be a hunter into that, but I've, I've been pretty open and honest about, uh, you know, my enjoyment of being outdoors and doing this sort of thing. Never been bear hunting, though, and so that was a little different. That was unique, and I, was, I didn't know how to prepare, honestly, and so I had to, like, read some stuff and, you know, watch some videos, and I was trying, you know, what in the world do I do? Um, and, and believe it or not, it was, um, it, it was enjoyable, but it was, a, it, was, it, it was with a ministry called Barnabas Network and um, who serves other uh, pastors and leaders and nonprofit leaders, um, it kind of gives them a way to be poured into when they're constantly pouring themselves into others. And so that's kind of what this was about. Um, although, you know, there still is the whole like, well, we're going to go hunt bears. And so you got to figure out like, how to do that. Nobody had ever done that before um, on this trip anyway. The, the outfitters had, praise the Lord. Um, and so, you know, it was just like, I don't know, like I'm supposed to take some stuff. And so it was, you know, jamming pack a bag and getting everything ready and, um, you know, and then getting up there and, and, you know, and it was getting across the border, and I'd never been to, I'd never stepped foot, like, in Canada before, and so just that was kind of an experience in itself, and it was beautiful up there, and then we lost cell reception, and so, like, forever, and and I didn't know that was going to happen, and so that was kind of crazy as well, um, and then we get there, and, the, and then the, the outfitters, you know, talking you through, like, you know, here's what to do, you know, and here's how bear react, and and somehow, when you talk about bear, it's, the plural is bear, you know, and I didn't know that. I was like, it's the bears, you know, like, I thought you talked about the bears. Um, so newbie here, you know, and, but, but nothing really prepares you for how long, because, because of the way these bears react, they, they just aren't um, like a, a patternable species, apparently. And so um, you just kind of have to go sit like all the time. And so that's what I did, like for 45 hours this week. Like, I spent a work week on a metal platform. It's embarrassing a little bit. Um, I did, but it, and it literally took till the last hour and a half of the last day before I even saw a bear. How about them apples? It's like, am I bear hunting, <laughs> like, or am I just in the woods? Um, and, and I didn't even have a shot opportunity. It was just I was there. But, you know, that's, that's a whole other story. Because really the point is that it's just a whole lot of waiting without really any knowledge or expectation of what's actually about to happen, like, and no control over it. Like, I couldn't make anything happen, and so it's just this long period of waiting. And, and really, that's a lot. That's, that's what we're going to talk about in this series, are these long seasons, these, these, and not even necessarily long, but just seasons of waiting that we find ourselves in where we don't necessarily have control over the circumstances and we can't do anything about it. And we don't really know what's going to happen next. And we kind of have an idea of what we want and what we need and some things that we want to see happen. And yet we, we don't have any control over it. And so are the lights on me or am I kind of off to the... Okay, it feels like maybe it's on the four thing, but maybe it's not. Um, so anyway, I apologize. Uh, so there's, you know, it's like there's always waiting that we're doing. As a matter of fact, and this is the way I would say it. Um, this is the way... To, to make this a little less unclear. Life is just a few actual activities, it feels like, strung together by a whole bunch of weights. You know, we go and we wait all the time. We wait on the light to turn green. We wait in a doctor's office in a waiting room. Like, like let's just pour a little salt on an open wound. Let's just call it a waiting room. You got to wait. You know, it's always waiting. Waiting in, for food in the restaurant and waiting on... You know, everything that, that has to happen, waiting on your, your wife or your husband to find their keys. <laughs> You're constantly waiting, right? Leroy, Rebecca, you know, it's just always, always a waiting game. And it just feels like it, it's constant. But, but here's the thing. When it comes to all that little, you know, trivial stuff, no big deal. Because, like, we know in those situations that the light will eventually turn green, that the food will eventually come. If it doesn't, we have control. We can go to another restaurant. You know, there... We have control uh, in those scenarios, but here's when the waiting gets bad. Matter of fact, we've gotten pretty good at managing our waiting. We're not good at being patient, but we've got phones. You know what I'm saying? And so even in the waiting, we, we you know, we, we're, I'm just maximizing my time, baby. You know, I'm just, I'm getting stuff done, you know, getting stuff, I'm listing stuff, I'm getting things done, posting, you know, I'm talking, I'm connecting, I'm so connected. And, and it's like, 
we don't even have to make the waiting, like we can control what we do in the waiting. Here's when the waiting becomes a problem and questions start to show up. Waiting becomes much more difficult, and this is true, when we don't know how long we'll have to wait, when our circumstances are out of our control, or when other people around us aren't having to wait. I mean, isn't that when waiting gets really difficult? You know, it's like, I, we're moving in six weeks, we've got to sell our house, but you have no control over being able to sell your house. Or you've been out of work for six weeks and you need to find a job, and you've tried to find a job, but you really have no control over whether or not the job is going to pan out or that it's going to be the right job. You know, it, it's like we don't really have control. You want to find the right person, you want to find, you know, a new situation, you want to get that promotion, but you don't really necessarily have control, or you want... You, you want the diagnosis to come in and for, for them to know what to do, and yet you can't make it happen, and maybe the doctors don't know. And so you begin to ask questions. You begin to wonder, it's like, when, when am I going to catch a break here? You ever thought that? I mean, whatever your season of waiting looks like, you know, what, what, you may be in the mess right now. You may be in a situation right now where it just feels like, it's like what is going on? Could, could, I, could it not pan out for me? When, when are things going to work out for me? Could I, you know, I just need some things to happen. Can I just get some things to happen? And we begin asking these kinds of questions and wondering, you know, is there even a God in the midst of this? It's like, do you even hear me? Do you even know what's going on in my life? Do you even care? And, and yet here's a, a more helpful question, I think. And this is the one that we're going to ask today and throughout this series. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Now, when we hear that question, here's how we typically answer it. We tend to think, okay, what am I waiting for? Well, I know what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting on Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. <laughs> That's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for graduation to show up. I'm waiting for the new job. I'm waiting for that promotion. You know, that's when things are going to get better. Well, I'm waiting. I'm in just a season right now, and I'm waiting on things to get better. I'm waiting for things to pan out. I'm waiting on that next election, you know, so that things will get better. I'm waiting on, you know, more gun control or less gun control, or I'm waiting on all these crazy people to get not crazy anymore, and then things will get better. I I'm waiting on the right policies to take place. I'm waiting on those things to happen. That's the way we think and, and begin to answer this question. What are you waiting for? Well, that's what I'm waiting for. When God asks you this question, it takes on very different meaning. And that's, what I want, that's where I want to go to today because it kind of sets the foundation. God asks this question in a different way that will should lead, especially if you're already a believer here and you put your faith in Jesus, it will lead to a different kind of answer for you. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to look at a story today found in, in Genesis, going all the way back to the beginning. This is Genesis, the first book of the Bible. It's also the first book in the Hebrew Scriptures, the first book of the Torah, the first book of the Pentateuch, Moses' law, the things that he wrote down. This is the first one. So it's the beginning of the stories. It kind of sets the pace. For scripture. This is the beginning of God's story with mankind. And so we're looking at one of the characters. We're going to look at a, a guy, pretty familiar story. His name's Joseph, not Joseph like, you know, Christmas story Joseph. So this is Joseph, like way back at the beginning, played a huge part in uh, the, really the founding of the nation of Israel. And here's why. Uh, it, it's, here's why we're looking at his story. Very familiar. And so, and, and there's something I'm going to ask you to do here in just a second in, in order to, as we look at this story, because even if you're not a believer, you've probably heard some, some you know, about his story. But here's why it's crazy. Because, because his story takes up 14 chapters out of a 50-chapter book. I mean, it's crazy. Like, his story. It's like, what, why? Why so much real estate? You know, how, why, why is so much of it given to this story? Well, that's what I want us to look at, and so I'm going to read some things. Well, I'm also then just going to interject and tell some of the story as well, because obviously we're not going to read 14 chapters together. But we're going to look at it today and over the next couple of weeks. But I, I, here's what I want us to see, because there's a lot of ways you could go with his story, because there's so much packed in here. It was his response to the waiting game that is so unique, that really set the, the trajectory for, for when is it, like Moses, that's an important story, bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. Joseph is what saved the nation of Israel at its very inception by bringing them to Egypt centuries before. And so that's why this story is so important. And so here's where we're going to jump in. So here, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. On a, 
especially when it's a really familiar like narrative type story, you and I have the privilege of already knowing how it ends. Okay, so you've got to do your best to assume like the, the only way that you're going to really get insight from Scripture as the Holy Spirit speaks to you is by uh, not, you know, well, I, I know how this ends. I know why this happens. I understand this. That's no big deal. Re- just imagine that this was the story that was being told and the story wasn't written yet. Like this was your story. And these seasons of waiting in Joseph's life when he didn't know the end of his own story. He didn't know he was going to end up in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. He had no idea. He didn't know how things were going to end up, and yet he chose to respond in a certain way. So Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, here's where we're going to pick it up. Joseph, a young man of 17, just a teenager, tending the flocks with his brothers, so they're shepherds, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father, a bad report. There's a lot in, in here about this. He's a tattletale, okay? So there's number one. Like, there's a little check mark against him. You know, he's a bit of a brat. You know, he's the youngest brother at this time. And, and, and he's kind of the favorite son, you know? Because um, his dad, Jacob, actually had four, well, actually two wives, and then they each had a maidservant. And, you know, might as well make some babies with them, too. And so that's what he did. And so, you know, four women, four moms... With the one dad, I know, like this is scripture. It's a little strange. Um, But so all of these half-brothers have to figure out how to get along. Well, Joseph was like least favorite. Why? Because he was daddy's favorite. Now, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. He was the son of Rachel, and, and he actually is the one who himself says, I, I love I love Rachel more than Leah. They're sisters. Rachel and Leah were sisters. And and he just said, I I love her more. He was the one, she was the one that he fell in love with from the very beginning. And so when he finally got to marry her and and she finally had a son, all because the three other ladies had had all had lots of sons at this point. Well, now finally, this was the firstborn of Rachel, and so he had a you know, had a special place in his heart. Okay? You know, and he's a brat. You know, like, let's just put that on top. Well, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. He's an irritating little boy and could not speak a kind word to him. Like, they just didn't, like, they didn't get along. Joseph had then had a dream, and you've probably heard all about these dreams that he had. Um, We're not going to talk about the dreams, um, but just know that they didn't like him. It did not paint the brothers in a very good light. And so when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Like, are you serious? We don't like you, kiddo. We're going to get rid of you. And here's the thing. We, at the very beginning of the story, we've got all this tension and this conflict, and it's nobody's complete fault. You know, it's kind of dad's fault because, you know, he was playing favorites a little bit. And it's kind of like Joseph's fault because he was a bit of a brat and a tattletale. And then it was also kind of the brother's fault for, you know, just not reading the story well and, you know, being a little jealous. And, you know, it's kind of everybody's fault, but, but it's created this, this tension and conflict early in the story here. Okay. So, and that sets the pace. That sets the bar for, for really the rest of the story. There's this family conflict, and it causes some things to happen. And so Jacob then sends his sons you know, out into the fields. And, and, and it's not like you know, they go out into the fields you know, out back in the fence in the, on the farm, and then they come back in for lunch you know, and dinner. Now, this was like, you know, take the sheep to wherever there's green pasture, and it could be miles and days and weeks that they're gone in order to you know, take care of these flocks. And so it didn't all just happen in one place. And so apparently, this, you know, all of the older, older sons are gone and, you know, they've been gone for a while and he sends Joseph to go check on them, which he didn't mind doing because it's like, I'm about to get me some dirt. You know, I'm about to get the good stuff, you know, so I'm going to tell dad like what they're doing. And so he leaves and goes to them and he travels to where they were supposed to be and apparently they had moved on. And so now they're even farther away from home than they were supposed to be to begin with. And so he's, he's, he's finally found them, and they see him off in the distance. And here's what happens. They, they begin to concoct this little plan. It's like, well, here we are. We've got some days or weeks left, and then we've got to travel home, and we've got some time. And here comes, you know, that little dreamer. And so we're really, we're really irritated by him now. Let's, let's just get, let's get rid of him. 
Like, I'm so mad. He, here he comes, you know, to check on us for daddy. And like, look, we're done. We're done with that. Let's get rid of him. Let's kill him. That's the plan. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe that he was wearing. And they took him and they threw him into the cistern, into a, a, a large well in the ground that would, have hold, that would have held water. The cistern was empty, though. There was no water in it. And then as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Now, let me just stop there for a second. It's like, what, what did that lunch look like? You know, we just took our brother. I mean, this, this is why you can't just read through Scripture. And it's like, I've read this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard this in Sunday school. Like, read this. I mean, like, this is crazy. Are you serious? You just threw, you, you basically derobed and stripped your youngest brother naked just because, you know, he was a brat, and you throw him in a hole, clearly not like a shout, like one that he couldn't get out of, probably beat him up a little bit and broke some bones on the way down, perhaps unconscious, who knows, but they've gotten rid of him, and now they're sat, you know, they're sitting down and they break out the tuna and rye, and they're having a conversation. It's like, ah, so they sat down and they had a meal. Are you serious? Seriously? Like, if that was on Gray's Anatomy, would you not just be so, like, irritated by those brothers? It's like, are you serious right now? I don't like them. Yet we read it in Scripture, and it's just kind of like, yeah, turn the page. Like, this, is, this, is, this is crazy stuff. But then they kind of come to their senses. Well, the camels of these Ishmaelites, they were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Basically, these were my wife. Okay, um, they basically find anything that they think might sell, might have any value at all, and they buy it so that they can make something on it. Oh, sweet. I, I got that on sale. It was only nine bucks, and I'm going to sell it for 13. Watch me get four dollars because that's how she operates. Like any value at all, she's going to sell it. And that's, that's what these guys are doing. They're on their way you know, they've got a lot of other stuff, but it's like, hey, we'll take some guys along too. We'll, we'll sell some folks. Yeah. We got some guys. Yeah, we can do that. But Judah said to his brothers, whoa, 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 whoa. So one of the brothers kind of pauses, wait, 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 what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? <laughs> Hold up. We're going to kill him, um, which is going to kind of get him out of the way. That's initially what we wanted to do. But like, what do we actually gain from that? Like, that doesn't actually get it. Let's, we could do something with this, like, right? I mean, let's, let's create a new scenario. Guys, what if we, instead of killing him, so kind, Judah, oh, thank you. Let's just sell him. Oh, the mercy of these brothers. Let's just sell him so that he can be a human slave to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. You know, that way we don't have to feel real guilty about it. After all, I mean, you know, he is our brother. Oh, so kind, these guys. I'm telling you, so much compassion in his heart. He's our own flesh and blood. And his brothers, they all agreed. Oh, Judah, that's right. We are so merciful. Let's pull him up out of this hole that we threw him in to die. And instead of wiping him off, apologizing, and taking him home to Papa, let's just sell him. Awesome. So that's what they did. And when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern, and they sold him for 20 shekels. We gained something. We got a little profit to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Pause, please. Okay. There's a couple of questions that you should be asking. Like, if you don't know the end of the story, if you've never read this before, that you that there's a couple of questions that should come to your mind. And, and especially if you kind of apply this to your life and to your circumstances and your, your season of waiting, because this begins a long, long, long drought in Joseph's life. Like a long season of multiple waits with no end in sight. Things not going well. And so here's the questions that you should be asking. You ready? Would God really, really, would God really allow something like this to happen to somebody he actually cared about? 
Where is God in this? You should be asking that question. Oh, I believe in God. You're worshiping God. Amen. It's like, wait a minute. Like, if I believe that something like this actually happened, um, where's God in this story? Why would God, like, really? Would he allow this to happen? Is that who God is? I mean, I mean, come on. Like, no, of course not. Why would, why would God allow that to happen? Because, I mean, clearly God is not a part of this because, you know, if God was a part of this, then, you know, Joseph would be at home cozied up with some popcorn watching Netflix with daddy, and these guys would be with the Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt. That's what would happen if God were involved. Fair? Why? Because we think, well, I mean, you know, the good guy is going to have good things happen to him, and the bad guys are going to have some bad things happen. And then when it doesn't actually work that way, we begin to wonder. It's like, hold up. That doesn't add up. That doesn't make sense. Tell me. I mean, where is God in this? You've got the th- Christians. Let's be honest with ourselves here. Don't just scoot, scoot by this. You've got to know how you would answer. Like, would God really allow this to happen? It's a good question. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. And then, new scenario, Potiphar. So now we're done with the brothers for now. And it's, you know, this new season of waiting for Joseph. And it doesn't really get much better. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, one of the, you know, king's officials. He was actually the captain of the guard. Bought Joseph from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. And so, and probably some of his own servants that he sent. Like, he probably didn't show up himself. Probably, you know, he sent some guys. Hey, guys, I need y'all to go. We're, we're kind of missing some slaves. They've had a couple of, uh, of them escape, and then a couple have died. Or, you know, we've kind of killed a couple by throwing them into a cistern. And so, we just need some newbies. Uh, if you'll go buy some, and they find Joseph, they purchase him, and they bring him back to the house. Now, here is the real wrench for the story, okay? This one doesn't make sense. This is where it's like, I'm not buying that, okay? The Lord was with Joseph. No, 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 no. That's not true. This is what we would think. If we're being honest, the Lord's not with Joseph here. Are you kidding me? I don't care. I'm not buying the whole Bible said so stuff. Like, the, the Lord was with Joseph? No, no, no. If the Lord was with Joseph, he'd be at home with his dad. This would be happening to the brothers. He, he can't be with Joseph because it would be working out in Joseph's favor. Like, like if the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord can't be. And yet, and yet, here, here's what we find out. Joseph believed the Lord was with him, whether you do or not. And we know this is, this is what was translated because the Lord was with Joseph. So much so that he prospered. That Joseph prospered. Well, wait a minute. He didn't have like a bank account, like full, you know, like a closet full of Nikes. Like, are you, how did he prosper? No, prosper doesn't always necessarily be, you know, it's not financial. It's just there was just blessing. Like there was there was favor on Joseph's life somehow. Well, well, why? Because of how he reacted to his belief and his confidence that what? That the Lord was with him. Because Joseph believed that. Joseph honestly believed, the Lord is with me. I'm in this waiting game. I don't know if things are going to get better. I would like to go home. He probably had some, some drought, some like really bad, some depression, some anxiety, some what's going to happen. Why did this happen? I don't know what, what's my future going to hold. Don't you know? It's like, am I, is, this, is that promotion going to happen? Am I going to find a wife? Or am I going to have babies one day? Am I going to live through this? I mean, surely all of those questions were in his mind, and yet... Without knowing his own story, okay, this is important to understand, there was no Bible, there was no Genesis, there was nothing for him to know, oh, okay, so things are going to work out, I'll just chill for a little while, you know, like I'll just hang in there and keep doing, no, 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 he only had one thing to go on, I just know that God is with me, and so things began to work out for him, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master, now, then then he tells us, when his master saw that the Lord was with him. It's like, did he really, though? I mean, do you, think, do you think Potiphar actually looked at Joseph and went, I believe that the God of the Israelites is with Joseph. No, he didn't know the God of Israel. 
He didn't know that God. He didn't know their God. And Joseph didn't know him all that well, just what his dad and his granddad had maybe taught him and passed along. And so he had very little knowledge and understanding. There was no Jesus. There was no New Testament. He didn't have anything to go on other than, hey, hey, God is faithful and he loves you and he'll be with you. That's all I got to go on? Mm, Yep. Well, this is going to be a tough few years, but I'm just going to go with it. I just believe that God is with me. And because of that, he just saw something different in Joseph. Moses, when he wrote this down years later, recognized that that was the fact that what what he saw in Joseph was that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. He just recognized it. And so Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Now he was like in the house. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Like, this was good news. Uh We'll go in there. This was good news. He had favor. Somehow, and, and it wasn't that, you know, Everybody around him said, oh, the Lord is with him. All, you know, he had this little fire over his head. And so clearly the Lord is with him. You know, he had some marks on his cheeks. No, no, no. They just knew that based on the fact that Joseph was being blessed, that he found favor in the eyes of these Egyptians, and that their house also began to be blessed as a result of Joseph being there, they just knew that what that meant was that the Lord must be with Joseph. Joseph, must, Joseph was simply responding the way somebody would respond, who really believes that God is with them. That's what Joseph did. He didn't have anything else to go on. I'm just confident that God is with me, and so I'm just going to keep going. And here's, here, let me, I want to re-ask this question as if God is asking this question, okay? So now it's God saying, so what are you waiting for? So, you know, put yourself, whatever your scenario is, whatever your waiting moment is, whatever it looks like for you. Maybe it's been a few days, a few weeks, maybe it's been years, and you feel like whatever the scenario, a relationship, you know, some brokenness, some animosity, some pain, some, a lack of forgiveness, bitterness, whatever it is, depression, job loss, the loss of loved ones, whatever it is, Whatever, you, whatever season of waiting you're in that you find yourself in, imagine God was saying to you, so what are you waiting for? And you're thinking, I don't know what I'm waiting for, dude. Like, I'm waiting for things to get better. Kidding me? Like, I know what I'm waiting for. Why are you asking? That's a dumb question. I'm waiting for healing. I'm waiting for things to work out. I'm waiting for my marriage to get better. I'm waiting for life to get better. But then he would add something. What are you waiting for after all? I'm with you. What are you waiting for? After all, now, you see, it takes a turn. Now it's not just about what you want and what you desire. He's saying, no, no, no. In spite of your circumstances and you not being in control of them and you not knowing what the future actually holds and how things are going to work out, now I'm asking you, so what are you waiting for if, if you know that I'm with you? You see how the question changes. Now it's a different, it has a different nuance. It's like, oh, so you're saying like, What are you waiting for? Why are you sitting there not doing anything when you know that I'm already with you, that I love you, that I am faithful in spite of your circumstances? I just just want you to keep getting up every day and going, you're with me. I'm confident in that. And that's that's, that's all we know that Joseph did. We don't know exactly how that played out, but we just know that he must have been confident that God was just with him. And here's what began to happen. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. We'll come right back to that. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. Are you kidding me? Why isn't it? And the Lord was with Joseph, and so he blessed Joseph. Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? Joseph trusted the Lord and believed that he was faithful, that he loved him, and that he was with him. And so the Lord blessed Jacob, or, or blessed Joseph. And yet, it's he believed it, and he continued to believe it, and he just lived in response to the fact that he believed that Jesus, that, that, excuse me, Jesus, he didn't know Jesus, but that God was really with him, that the Lord was with him, and then he blessed Potiphar. It's like, hold up. Not cool. That can't be right. 
That's not the way this is supposed to work. That doesn't make... I mean, this, this, should, this should wreck some of your theology about what you believe, who you believe God is and what God is like. We don't have a problem singing these things. I mean, we don't have a problem like, you know, being encouraged by it on Instagram or on Facebook, you know, or somebody kind of quoting a scripture here and there. God is faithful and he loves you and he will take care of you. And there's nothing you could do that would cause him to love you less or more. It's like, oh, yes, Jesus. And then when we go through a difficult season, it's like all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't know. Like, where's God in this? This doesn't add up. It's like when we interpret our own circumstances, we, don't say, we wouldn't necessarily say it this way, but this is how we respond. As if we really believe that when things are going well, God must be blessing us and he's with us, and when they're not, then he's not. Like, really? Is that what we would say? Is that what you believe? You won't, you won't have faith long, will you? I mean, good gracious, because when things start going wrong, it's like, okay, blaming God, I'm out. He must not be with me. I'm not buying it. And yet, that's not the character of God. The character of God is that he loves you completely, that he is faithful, and that he is always with you. And if that's true of God, then it's in spite of circumstance, in spite of what's going on, good or bad. I, I just That is scripture. That's what we know about the character of God. Well, that just didn't make sense. Like, how could God be in that? Like, what, where is God in that? Like, man, I just can't answer that. I can only look back at Scripture in these kind of scenarios and just know that somehow, and it took years. This is not like things worked out overnight and he ended up back at Dad's house, you know. I mean, this, it destroyed those relationships. It wrecked his dad, Jacob. Believed his favorite youngest son, his, at the time his only son of Rachel, believed to be dead for decades. Oh my goodness. And God's in that? Like, well, I just know that God loves me, that he's faithful, and that he's always with me. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess I just... That's what I'm going with. And so I'm just going to respond as anybody would respond who really has confidence that God is with them. So let me ask you this question this way. So I'm just going to tweak it a little bit. So if God is really with you, even in the waiting, then what are you waiting for? And let me talk specifically to Christians because I think this is a hang-up for people who aren't. I think if, if you're not a Christian, if you're watching online, if you're in the room with us, or maybe you're just kind of like, you're just, you're just on the outside and you're looking in and you're thinking, you know, maybe this is one of the things that, that you want to know. It's like you want to ask a believer. You want to say, no, okay, oh. So you're telling me, okay, you're telling me that you're a Christian. You say you're a Christian. You go to church. You know, you pay your taxes. I mean, your tithe. Um, you know, you do all the right things, and you say the right things, and you try to live your life accordingly. And so you, you say you believe that, right? And you believe, you, I mean, you quote John 3.16 to me all the time. You tell me God is love, and that he loved me, loves me so much that he gave his son to die on a cross for me. So, right? And you tell me, yeah, yeah, I believe that. So let me get this straight. So you believe that, but then when things aren't like working out for you, and when you went through that really that horrible season, remember when you lost your job and the house was like you were about to have to declare bankruptcy and the marriage was on the rocks and things. You remember how angry and bitter and like like just so negative you were, and you told me how much you doubted God and that He just must not be a part of that, and that yeah, but you know, dude, things worked out like things you know got better. Record. Yeah, but like in the moment. You're telling me, like, that what you believe is only when things are going good? Like, don't you think that'd be a question for a non-Christian? Don't you think people are looking at you and me and thinking, like, what's different about you if your world is wrecked when things aren't going your way? Like, I, don't, I mean, I can do that on my own, dude. Like, you're, you're telling me there's hope. That there's more to this life than just this life. 
You're telling me that God is love and that he loves me. And so if, if you're saying that and that you believe that, then that should be like in spite of your circumstances, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. The answer is yeah. And so we have a choice. Joseph had a choice every single day. He got up every single day and he had a decision that he could make of where he was going to go with what he understood and believed about who God is. He had a decision to make, and you do too. Look something like this. Will I judge and measure God's love for me and his will for my life based on my circumstances? Or am I confident that God is with me in spite of my circumstances? That's a choice you get to make every day. Am I going to live in such a way in such a way that I actually believe that God is with me. Uh, like, like anybody might respond to life and life circumstances who is confident that God is with them. Like, I, I, am I going to choose to do that? Or am I going to choose? Because I'm telling you, this is short-lived faith. If it's based on, well, let me evaluate what's going on in my life, and that'll determine what I believe about who God is. That's a, that, is a, that is a train wreck like waiting to happen. I promise you, pull out of the station, you won't get far. <laughs> it can't be that. It is not circumstantial. Is that fair? Does that make sense? I know it's not like that's not one of those easy pills to swallow. We want to keep taking the blue pill, you know? I don't really want to take the red pill. I like the blue pill. It makes me feel good. It makes me pretend about my reality. And that as long as things are going well, God must love me and be with it. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. The red pill is reality. And it is much more, it is a much better approximation of who God really is. I mean, we, we'll never have the full picture of God until we're face to face with him. But like right now, to the best of our ability, we just know that the foundation is that God is with me. He loves me. He is faithful. He is true to his promises. And he will always be there in spite of what's going on in my, lives and in my life. And so as long as that's the foundation, man, that becomes rock solid. Faith. Does that make sense? And so I want to rearrange the question to give you something to ask yourself. And, and I, you know... Here's, you ready? You got some homework. And you, you can do this today. It doesn't do you any good if you leave it in here. And so this is the one, so this is the same question, but I want to help, help you make it personal. If God is really with me, even in the waiting, then what am I waiting for? What, why? Well, I'm waiting on things to give it. No, 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 no. What are you waiting for? Why, why are you complacent? Why are you twiddling your thumbs? Why are you acting like you've got nothing to share with the world, even though things aren't going well? Why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? You could just be making steps in my direction and serving me and loving me and sharing the love of Jesus with other people simply because you know that I'm faithful and I'm with you, not because things are working out for you. Like even how much, how much more impact do you think it has when you're going through some really tough stuff, but you're the one encouraging other people? Pfft, what? Yeah. Isn't that what impacts our lives? When you watch a couple or a family or an individual and they go through something just horrible and, and yet in the midst of it, they're like, yeah, we don't go, you're so pie in the sky, dude. Are you serious? No, we go, Wow. Man, I, I, hope I, I hope I can respond that way. Yeah, I wonder, I, I wonder the, the shootings that have happened recently. I wonder how the church is responding. I wonder how Christians are responding in the midst of that. Oh, you know, we're up in arms. You know, we got to get a new system. We got to, oh, you know, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. So God's somewhere in this. I can't explain it, and I'm not going to just like act like you just put a little balm on it and everything just gets better. Like there's horrible, devastating consequences. Absolutely. Because we are, we are living in a broken world. But God is still who he is. And he's not wanting us to wait around 
on the next election, you know, or wait for things to get better, or for gas prices to fall, or for our income to go up. He's, he's wanting us to live as if we believe and are confident that he is with you and me. Doesn't that sound good? Can you imagine, Christians, this is for you, can you imagine living your life that way? If you really believe that, how that would change the steps you take and the way you respond to your circumstances. If you're not a Christian, don't you want that? Doesn't that sound good? Yeah, dude, like seriously? Well, I mean, test me. I'm, I'm totally good with that. Test me. Like, I, begin, to, begin to follow him. Eventually, you'll find him. Like, really follow him. The disciples weren't Christians when they began to follow Jesus. They didn't believe everything about Jesus when they began to follow him. You can begin to follow Jesus before you believe anything. So I just... Is it worth it, that kind of hope? It is. Would you respond? I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you'd bow your heads, just close your eyes for just a second, if you'd hang with me. If you've never done that, but you want that. If you're at home, you can do this at home. If you're online, if you're watching later, if you're in the room, and you just haven't done that before, you've not really surrendered yourself and just giving it your all. I'm willing to walk with Jesus. I'm willing to give this a try. I'm just going to put my trust and my faith that he is with me, that he really does love me. Would you respond by saying something like this? Just say, Heavenly Father, I want to know you in that way. And I've got just enough faith to believe that you really do love me and that you sent your son for me and that you paid the price for what's broken inside of me. I believe that much. And I'm willing to hang on to that. And so I give you my life. I confess that I'm a sinner, that I'm a mess without you. And I believe that Jesus is my savior. So I give you my life. I give you the reins, take control. And I put my faith and my trust that you are with me, that you love me. In Jesus' name, amen.